and good evening Corolians for a second time. This is just a second. Uh, again, from the subtitle, you can see what I'm talking about. What a second is, what can happen in one second, and why do we need leap seconds? So, firstly, does that number mean anything to you? 28 million seconds. What does that refer to? Any thoughts? That's how long it has been since the UK went into lockdown in March of last year. Now, does 28 million seconds sound like a small length of time or a large length of time? That's probably a question of your perception of how you feel about lockdown and what you think about one second. We don't normally measure long lengths of time in seconds. That's just a reminder that seconds might be a little bit longer than you think in terms of when you think about lengths of time that are a fraction of a year. So I'm talking about how motion defines time, uh, what a second is, how it's defined, what can happen in one second, and the main thrust of this talk is the fact that the Earth's spin is slowing down, the Earth's rotation is slowing. Why is that and what are the consequences? If the day is getting longer, does that mean hours are getting longer? Does that mean seconds are getting longer? And what is a leap second? So, time and motion. How do we think about time? Well, we always measure time by the motion of something. Although we might think of space and time as entirely separate, we can't actually measure time unless we think about motion. So, of course, for millennia, the passage of time has been measured by the motion of astronomical objects, such as the sun moving across the sky, giving us a changing shadow on a sundial, or the changing phases of the moon. They both give us an indication of the passage of time. Surely defining a second is trivial. The Earth spins once a day, by definition, and a day is 24 hours, and an hour is 60 minutes, and a minute is 60 seconds. So one second, effectively by definition, is that fraction, 1 over 24 times 60 times 60, which happens to be uh, 1 over 86,400, that fraction of one day. Simples, that's all it is, isn't it? Well, that would be, again, a rather short talk, and no, we're going to look at it in a little more detail. That number, 86,400, the number of seconds in a day, is going to crop up more than once, not surprisingly, during this particular talk. Let's think about how, how the Earth moves. The Earth goes round the Sun in an ellipse, which means the speed at which the Earth moves changes as the Earth goes round the, the orbit. So we can see that on the left-hand side, when the Earth is close to the Sun, the Earth travels quite a long way in one month, indicated by this uh, arc here. Compared to when the Earth is a long way from the Sun, it travels a relatively small distance in one month. As it happens, those two blue areas are the same. That's why the greater distance gives rise to a lower velocity of the Earth and a smaller distance travelled in a given time. But if you imagine the Earth is turning at a fixed rate, you can see that the position of the Sun in the sky is not going to be the same on every day, because sometimes the Earth is moving slowly relative to the Sun, and sometimes the Earth is moving quite quickly relative to the Sun. We can actually measure that, or show that, or observe that. If we were to photograph the Sun at the same time of day throughout the year, we get this characteristic shape called an analemma. The north-south variation is a result of the tilt of the Earth, the 23.5 degree tilt of the Earth gives that variation. In the northern hemisphere, the sun, of course, is higher in the sky in summer and lower in the sky in winter. But notice that the east-west variation there, the sun does not arrive at the meridian at the same time each day. It doesn't arrive at noon each day. The east-west variation is a result of what we just saw, the fact that the Earth's orbit around the Sun is an ellipse and hence sometimes moves fast and sometimes moves slow. So you can think of it as saying the Sun sometimes arrives at the meridian a little bit late and sometimes it arrives a little bit early, the meridian being the line that effectively defines south from the northern hemisphere. It can be quite a few minutes off. Although the sun might be nominally south at noon, it could be 
uh, 10 or 15 minutes early or 10 or 15 minutes late because of that elliptical orbit. That's why sundials are never considered to be accurate in terms of giving us civil time. So the analemma tells us that sundials are not accurate because of the Earth's orbit, not because of the rate at which the Earth spins on its axis. If we want to determine how long it takes the Earth to turn once, we need something much more accurate than a sundial. And when I talk about the length of the day, I'm not talking about the interval between sunrise and sunset, or sunset and sunrise. I'm talking about the length of time it takes the Earth to turn once on its axis relative to the sun. So we need accurate clocks if we're going to determine what the Earth is doing. So since the 1960s, we've had a very precise definition of a second. That many oscillations of a cesium atom define a second, or more accurately, it's the frequency of the microwave radiation that corresponds to electrons jumping around inside a cesium atom, a particular isotope of cesium called cesium-133. That is called the cesium standard, and that's been with us since the 1960s. Cesium is, has been chosen because it's a very stable atom, and if you build uh, a clock that measures this frequency for a cesium atom, and then you build another clock, you find that they are very, very close. In other words, there's very little variation if you build different versions of the same clock. Of course, you can't tell whether or not a clock is drifting unless you compare it with another clock. So generally speaking, when atomic clocks are built and used, they build a cluster of them. You might build five or ten clocks and then compare them all with each other to make sure they all agree as to what one second is. If one is out of kilter with the other nine, something is amiss with that clock. So the use of an atomic clock can give us accuracy to a precision of something like one nanosecond, one billionth of a second per day. That's equivalent to one second in about 30 million years. And NASA are developing small versions of atomic clocks. This little box on the top, not the whole thing that they're looking at, but just this box here, barely the size of a toaster, that's a deep space atomic clock. The intention is to put these into space probes in the future to improve navigation accuracy. If you know precisely what the time is, and you know how you've been accelerating since you left Earth, then you know where you are. If you know acceleration and you know the time, you know your position in three-dimensional space. So that's the idea of navigation. Uh, so in principle, you can always use information from Earth, but the idea is to make these deep space probes as autonomous as possible by making their internal clocks as accurate as possible. And time accuracy matters, even here on Earth. If you want to use a GPS system, you're looking at a signal that's come from a number of satellites orbiting the Earth, and you're relying on the timing between each of these satellites, each of which has its own atomic clock. If there was a problem with the timing, if the clocks were wrong by, let's say, a millisecond, then the distance you calculate by working out how long is it since the signal came from that satellite down to Earth, the distance could be wrong by the distance light travels in a millisecond, which is about 300 kilometres. In other words, the GPS wouldn't even put you in the right country, necessarily. If the clock was wrong by only one microsecond, one millionth of a second, then the distance would be wrong by the distance that light travels in a microsecond, about 300 metres. It would put you in the right town, but it wouldn't necessarily tell you which road you're driving along. So, yes, accuracy matters at the nanosecond sort of level. And that's why GPS clocks would be resynchronized with each other by checking against a ground station every few hours. In principle, the clocks in the GPS system can, can work quite happily for a few days or maybe a week or two, but just to be on the safe side, they're resynchronized with the ground station every few hours, just in case they're drifting slightly, to try and maintain that accuracy. If we ask what can happen in one second, well, the fastest supercomputer can do something like 200,000 million million calculations in one second. A phenomenal amount of calculation power in these supercomputers that are dotted around the world. 
Even so, if you want to do a very complex simulation, such as, for instance, trying to work out a, what the early universe was doing or how the universe has expanded over the last 13.8 billion years, a simulation, a complex simulation, might take days, weeks, or even months of number crunching time, even with that many calculations per second running. That's an awful lot of calculations. We know that light travels, well, it used to be 186,000 miles per second. Now it's 300,000 kilometers per second. OK, slight change of unit, but essentially the same thing. The fastest man-made object, or at least two of the fastest man-made objects that we know about, are the Voyager planetary probes that were thrown out of the solar system back in the 1980s. They're traveling at about 16 kilometers for every second. So they're obviously getting much further away from us second by second by second. But of course, 16 kilometers per second is just tiny compared to the amount of distance that light can travel in one second. If we think about a slightly more earthly way of measuring one second, let's just look at what actually happens on the internet every second. In this particular case, I'm taking statistics from 2019. For every second in 2019, there were 300,000 texts sent backwards and forwards between people. There were also 60,000 searches carried out per second, either by Google, other search engines are available, if you prefer. Something like 75,000 videos were streamed each and every second of 2019. I believe about two thirds of them involved cats in some way or another, but still that's an awful lot of videos streamed every second. 700,000 messages were sent every second via things like WhatsApp or other applications. And one of the most staggering statistics is that every second, three million emails were sent every second of the year. Some of them might have been spam, but still, that's an astonishing number. I would imagine all of those have gone up quite substantially in 2020 and no doubt will be even higher in 2021. So an awful lot can happen in one second. Atomic clocks are telling us that the Earth is slowing down. Although we can think of a second as being just that particular fraction of a day, 1 over 86,400, we have a problem because the Earth is slowing down. Back in the 1960s, specifically in 1968, that's when people started using so-called atomic time, when there were enough atomic clocks in the world that they could accurately note the passage of time and, if necessary, measure the rotation of the Earth. So back in 1968, the length of time it took the Earth to turn once relative to the Sun was 24 hours. In other words, 86,400 seconds. The day was exactly 24 hours long. If you like, the second was defined such that 86,400 seconds equaled the length of time it took the Earth to rotate once relative to the Sun. But the Earth is slowing down. 50 years later, the rotation period of the Earth is no longer 86,400 seconds, it's now 86,400.001. The Earth now takes an extra millisecond to turn compared to 50 years ago. Not only that, but it doesn't seem to be slowing down smoothly. We'll see a graph of that shortly. Why is the Earth slowing down? Let's deal with that first. Well, 4.5 billion years ago, the, the proto-Earth, the very early Earth, was struck by an object about the size of Mars, which we're calling Theia. We don't know how fast the Earth was rotating at that point, because the impact of Theia would have completely reset the clock as far as rotation was concerned. The amount of material that was spalled off in this particular impact eventually formed the Moon. Some of the material collapsed back onto the Earth, some of the material was spalled away and produced the Moon. When the Earth recovered from the shock of that impact of Theia, its rotation period was about five hours or so. Ever since then, it's been slowing down. So the Earth was spinning very quickly in the early days, and now it's slowing down. Why is that? It's because of the effect of the Moon. The Moon is dragging the Earth back. 
So the moon is raising tides on the earth, we get a tidal bulge, but notice that the tidal bulge isn't simply on the line joining the earth to the moon, it's offset because of the rotation of the earth. The earth, if you like, is dragging this bulge around by a few degrees off the line joining the earth to the moon. And the moon is pulling on this excess water that's bulging out here, and that is what is putting the brakes on the earth. In a sense, a little bit of angular momentum is being swapped. The earth is being slowed down and the moon is being speeded up. They're exchanging a little bit of angular momentum because of the tides that the moon raises on the earth. Now at the moment, of course, the earth's rotation is faster in one day than the length of time it takes the moon to go around the earth. The earth rotates in one day, but the moon takes about a month to go round in its orbit. Because the Earth is slowing down and the Moon is speeding up, eventually, in a long, long time into the future, they are going to be the same value. In other words, at the moment, the Moon face is, of course, always the same face pointing towards the Earth. We always see just the near side, not the far side of the Moon. Eventually, the Earth's rotation will synchronise with the Moon's orbit, and eventually, the converse will be true. In other words, the rotation rate of the Earth will match the rotation of the Moon, and one side of the Earth will always face the Moon, and one side of the Earth will never face the Moon. So there will be half of the Earth that will never be able to see the Moon. You'll have to travel around the Earth to see the Moon. That's not going to happen for a while, don't panic. But that's why the Earth's rotation is slowing. It's the effect of the Moon on the tidal bulges. So over billions of years, we can understand how the Earth has slowed down from a five-hour rotation, five rotation down to something close to 24. But when we look in detail, we see that there are variations. But who cares what the rotation period of the Earth is anyway? So what? A day is not an exact number of seconds, but who cares if it's actually 86,400 and change? Well, it's just like the problem we have with a year not being an exact number of days. We know, for instance, that a year is not 365 days. It's 365.2422 blah 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 days. And if not addressed, then the calendar would drift relative to the seasons. And we've decided that we don't really want that. We prefer to have a calendar such that a particular month occurs in a particular season. So to avoid the calendar drifting, despite the fact that one year is not an integer number of days, we decide to insert an extra day every so often. If we insert an extra day into the calendar year every fourth year, that would make the calendar year 365 and a quarter days. Almost right. Not quite, but it's close. If we skip a leap day in a century that's not divisible by 400, that's the rule we decide to introduce, that would make the calendar year 365.2425, very close to the actual length of a year. So by having a leap day added every fourth year and skipping a leap day in a century if that century year is divisible by four, sorry, is not divisible by 400, Sorry, adding it if it's not divisible by 400. No, I got it right in the first place. Skipping a leap day in a century, the year that's not divisible by 400, then we get this very accurate number. So it's the same thing with the rotation of the Earth. Just like with the calendar, if we want to keep the calendar synchronized to the seasons, we need to add a day every once in a while. If we want our 24-hour clock to stay synchronised with the rotation of the Earth, in other words, we want to know when the sun is in the sky based on our clocks, then we need to add a leap second for the same reason we had have to add a leap day. If the length of the days are changing and we want to keep clocks synchronised to the sun, we need to add a leap second every once in a while. Well, strictly speaking, we don't have to. We could keep the clocks synchronised with the rotation of the Earth. If the Earth is slowing down, we could just let the seconds get longer. 
But if we let the seconds get longer, the scientists would be furious because it would mean that we have to keep adjusting the atomic clocks to have them run slower or faster, depending on what the Earth is doing, slower and slower and slower. So the definition of what we mean by a second would keep changing continuously. And that would be a very difficult of way of ever doing science if we had to keep redefining what we mean by the unit of time. It would be totally impractical. So this is a graph of how long the day is after we've subtracted 86,400 seconds. It's what's left over if you like. And here we can see what's left over in milliseconds as a function of time from the 1960s up to essentially the present day. I think this one actually goes to 2019. And what we see is there's a slow variation and there's a rather rapid variation of the length of the day going up and down. And if you look, for instance, at these uh, rather noisy looking spikes, you might notice that these spikes are always separated by exactly one year. So there's an annual variation, there's a seasonal variation to the length of a day. And that's understood because when we look at the atmosphere, the summer and the winter, of course, are indicated by the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere being pointed towards the sun. And that changes the way the atmospheres the atmosphere moves around the Earth. It changes the trade winds, it changes the, the uh, atmospheric circulation. And if the atmosphere moves in a different way between northern winter and northern summer, that means there's a slight change to the rotation of the Earth. The atmosphere is a very low mass compared to the total mass of the Earth, but it produces an effect that's big enough to see as an annual variation in the rotation of the Earth. Well, that's all very well, and maybe some of these tiny little blips that you might be able to see, some of those are probably earthquakes, because the Earth's crust changes its shape, and maybe the ocean floor lifts by a few metres. That changes, again, the way the Earth rotates. But what is producing that big variation? The Earth seems to have slowed down during the 1970s until it was something like a day three milliseconds longer than it used to be. But then it speeded up again, and then it slowed down again, and then it speeded up again. What is producing this years or decades long variation in the rotation rate of the Earth? Well, I'm not sure there's exactly a consensus on that. The yearly variation, that's the atmosphere, fine, but why should it vary over decades? I think it's uh, the geophysicists probably claim that what's going on is it might be the mantle of the Earth, which is a sort of convective region where there, there are changes within the mantle in between the core and the crust. Maybe there are some changes there that give rise to perhaps changes of density that make the Earth's rotation change on a time period of order decades. But perhaps that's not so well understood. We know about leap days. If you want to synchronise the calendar with the season, you introduce a leap day according to the formula we had before, and it's usually done by convention by adding an extra day to February. So February the 29th is inserted every once in a while to keep things synchronised. And because of the accuracy of that calculation, it looks like that's going to be good for the next 10,000 years or so. What about leap seconds? Where do they get dealt with? Well, that's a little more tricky. Because the rotation of the Earth we've seen looks a little bit irregular, a little bit chaotic, we can't have a regular plan of this is when we're going to introduce leap seconds, because we don't know what the rotation of the Earth is going to look like next year, or in 10 years, or in 20 years' time, so we don't know how long the day is going to be. We can't easily work out whether we need a leap second or not until we look in detail at the rotation of the Earth. So a body is responsible for dealing with leap seconds. It's called the International Earth Rotation Service, which is a wonderful name. I sometimes wonder what would happen if these guys take a day off. Does the Earth stop turning or does it continue on? OK, they're responsible for the Earth Rotation Service. They decide how often a leap second needs to be added. And then you have the question, well, 
when do you insert a leap second? You might decide you need one, but how are you going to make the choice of where it goes? Well, if we come back to this picture, now let's ignore the day length, which is this one we've just looked at. Now let's look at this rather fainter grey line, and we're now looking at the scale on the right-hand side here in seconds. Let me just move the camera slightly. So if we look at leap seconds, they were introduced in 1972, when it was realised that the day length is changing, and at the point where the day length was three milliseconds longer than 24 hours, that's the point at which they started introducing leap seconds. And since then, they've introduced about 25 leap seconds. Notice that when the Earth's rotation period was 24 hours plus three milliseconds, the day was quite long, and so lots of leap seconds were added. But for some reason or other, in between, say, 2000 and 2005, the Earth had speeded up again, and the Earth's rotation period at that point was very nearly 24 hours. It was 24 hours and a smidgen more, but not by much. So during these years, 2000 to 2005, the Earth's rotation period was about 24 hours, so there was no need to add any leap seconds for quite a few years. And now you see that we've introduced a few leap seconds in the past few years. The last one was introduced in, if I remember correctly, 2016, I think it was, the end of 2016. And because, again, the Earth's rotation period is close to 24 hours, we haven't had one for the last couple of years. What does a leap second actually look like? Well, you know what happens to a clock as you approach midnight and then click over to the next day. What happens is you go from 23.59.59 and after you've 23.59.59 you get click, it goes over to zero and you start the next day. If you want to introduce a leap second, after 23.59.59 you get something new. You get 23.59.60. And then it goes to zero. So that last minute actually contains 61 seconds. So if anybody asks you how many seconds in a minute, the answer isn't 60. The answer is usually 60, but every once in a while there are 61 seconds in a minute. So when should you introduce a leap second? Should it always be at midnight? Local midnight? Yeah, but local where? Midnight where? Every time zone has its own midnight. If the Australians decided to add a leap second on a given day at midnight, they would do it before Europe decided to add a leap second at their midnight, which would come before the United States decided to add a second at their midnight. Which means all the clocks in the world would be out of sync. Unless you actually add a leap second at the same instant, not at your local time midnight, the clocks around the world will be out of sync by up to one second. And in a world of global finance, one second matters. Remember what can happen in one second? A computer can do 200,000 million million calculations. How many electronic transactions can you make in that one second? If a bank in one part of the world wants to transfer a billion dollars to another bank and they decide to do it at a particular point in the clock, if the people sending the money and the people receiving the money don't agree on what the time is, that money could be in limbo for half a second. And if some enterprising young individual comes along and decides to nick it during that half second, who did the money actually belong to in that half second between this bank sending it and this bank receiving it at a particular clock pulse? So synchronisation of clocks matters across the world. Some people really don't like the idea of arbitrarily putting an extra second into the clock, especially when that means you have to have a minute that has 61 seconds in it. Some computer systems really don't like leap seconds for that reason. Although a time of 23.59.60 is a perfectly valid time, if a leap second has been introduced, there are some computer systems which, if you try to set the clock to 23.59.60, some computer systems actually crash. 
And some companies really don't like leap seconds. Again, any company that deals with global commerce and global electronic finance has to worry about synchronization. For instance, Google have decided to do something different to everybody else. Instead of adding a leap second at the end of a minute and making a minute 61 seconds, they use a concept called leap second smearing to avoid a minute having 61 seconds. They add the leap second not at the end of a minute or the end of the day. They add it drip feed. They add the second a few microseconds at a time continuously throughout the day. How do they do that? They simply run their clock slow. So if a leap second is going to be introduced, rather than wait until the end of the day or at some point in the day adding a second, rather than have that discontinuity, they run their clock slow for the entire day, such that by the end of the day, that one second has been made up. Well, okay, but if Google do it differently to everybody else, that means technically Google's clocks are different from everybody else's clocks for the entire day. And then they're going to be synchronized once everybody else puts their leap second back in again. Imagine if you did that with a leap day. Rather than saying, I'm going to wait until the end of February, and then I'm going to insert a day and have a discontinuous addition, which is going to be different from other years. Imagine if you decided to do leap day smearing. There's the cartoon. If Google expanded its idea of leap second smearing to cover leap days as well, then you get the situation. Why do the clocks say it's three o'clock in the morning? Well, adding an extra day at the end of February produced too many glitches. Instead, we're running our clocks 3% slow during the entire February, and then we avoid the need to add a leap day at the end of February. OK, that's a joke, but you can see how absurd it would be if you did it with leap days, but that's precisely what is being done with leap seconds by some companies, but not all companies. So there's the problem. How do you deal with leap seconds? Do you decide that we definitely need leap seconds and they need to be added? If they do need to be added, how are you going to add them? If everybody doesn't agree on how it's going to be done, clocks will not be synchronized. It might only be out of sync for one second during the year, but a lot can happen during that one second. The International Telecommunication Union, the ITU, is a UN, a United Nations agency that was mandated to figure this out and come up with a solution. What are we going to do about this problem of deciding if we need leap seconds, where are we going to put them, and when are we going to introduce them, given that we don't know what the Earth's rotation is going to be doing in the future. Well, in 2015, they decided. They came up with a mo monumental decision. And that decision was not to decide anything until 2023. They decided to procrastinate, which is great. So we're now in 2021, maybe in a couple of years, Somebody somewhere will figure out what to do about leap seconds. Until then, it's a little bit of a mess. So I've been telling you about what a second is. I've been telling you what can happen in a second, why the Earth's rotation is slowing down, the consequences of that slowdown in rotation, and hence the need for a leap second and the problems associated with a leap second. So thank you for your attention over the last 2,000 seconds. Thank you.